Hey folks, Ray from DCRamRack.com. Today I've got Polar's newest wearable, the Polar M430. Um, now this is watched right here that you see on my wrist. And what's unique about this is that it's basically the M400 that you saw in the past, but now with an optical sensor on the back. Um, but it's not just that, there's actually a number of other features as well. Uh, so let's dive into some of those new and unique things, then we'll go out for a run, and then after that we'll come back and analyze the data. So as I was saying, the M430 builds on the M400. The M400 came out about three years ago now, and it was a really popular watch. Um, it was basically a lower priced watch with GPS on it. Uh, it it kind of like sweeped the market in terms of being a budget and kind of mid-range watch all in one shot with GPS on it. And Polar's done a lot of updates over the last few years to make it much more capable. Uh, for example, it's got now smartphone notifications, and a lot of other smaller features that they've added to try to keep up with the times. But one of the things that would take new hardware was an optical sensor, which is what you see here. So Polar now has put a six LED optical sensor into the back of this, uh, and that allows them to give you optical heart rate during workouts. Uh, so it's not gonna do 24 by seven heart rate activity, uh, but it does do workout heart rate uh, based on this optical sensor. Now there are some unique things with this optical sensor. One, it actually will work in swimming mode, which is something that like if a lot of the Garmin watches do not work in swimming mode from an optical sensor standpoint. And then finally, it does work with the fitness test. So that's something that again, a lot of other units out there today do not work with kind of their uh, fitness progression or fitness testing type uh, methodologies, but actually that does work here on the M430. There's also a change that in the M400, they did not have vibration alerts. Instead, they just had audio alerts. This now has vibration alerts, but does not have audio alerts. So that kind of, you lose one and gain the other. Uh, so a bit of a bummer there. Um, this does have though the training plant that you saw on the M400, which again is a bit of a differentiator compared to other watches in the same price uh, point. Most watches under about 200 bucks don't tend to have training plans. This is slightly more than that. Um, so it competes with, uh, for example, the Vivo Active HR that sits up at uh, 250, um, but this is the 229, so a little bit cheaper. So you have to balance some of the additional sport features there um, with this here. Next, they've also introduced a low power mode. And so this can get up to 30 hours of GPS on time at a reduced recording rate. So they've got three recording rates. They've got a one second recording rate and every 30 second recording rate and then every 60 second recording rate. Uh, and at that every 60 second recording rate, you get 30 hours of GPS performance. That's useful for long hiking, for example. Um, not as so good for running because you're gonna lose too much data along the way. Um, during that entire time frame, though, it will record heart rate at one second. Uh, Polar says there isn't a lot of difference though between the every 30 second and every 60 second heart rate recording. Uh, so do keep that in mind, but still 30 hours is pretty impressive for this uh, and a lot of other units at this price point, in fact no other units at this price point, uh, get that amount of battery. Now they did add a slightly larger battery to it um, and with that battery though they're actually using that for powering this optical sensor. So yes it is technically a bigger battery from a milliamp hour standpoint, uh, but that kind of is compensated by the fact that it does have this new optical heart rate sensor in it that's going to burn a bit more. They've also added new watch faces, which, I mean, the watch faces on the, uh, the Polar lineup aren't exactly the most exciting ones out there, but they did add a couple new ones to it over the M400. Uh, so you have a couple more options that you can play with as well, which is kind of nice. And then finally, when it comes to features here compared to the M400, this is really Polar's first watch that can be handled completely and totally via the phone. Uh, so you can do firmware updates via the phone now, as well as all the normal sync that you could always do previously with the phone. Uh, but you do not need a desktop computer with this watch at all at any stage or any point in time except one, if you wanna do training plans. So if you wanna configure those training plans, you have to have a full desktop browser somewhere. But if you've got a desktop browser at work or somewhere else, that'll work just fine for configuring that. It's just really tough to do on the phone. It doesn't really work very well. Um, and you don't even need to have software on that other desktop computer. It just needs to have access to the Polar Flow website to be able to do that configuration. And then it'll sync those training plans and all the different training activities within it wireless via, wirelessly via your phone. So as far as availability goes, the watch will come out in May, so not quite yet. Um, it will be 229 US dollars as well as euros. Uh, so it is a bit of a bump over the M400, which sits about 169 right now. Um, about a $50, $60 bump, which you know for an optical sensor is kind of normal, but I do worry it may be a bit overpriced. Uh, we look at, for example, the Garmin 435, which certainly has less function than this, no doubt, uh, but that's under $200. Uh, Fitbit sits under $200. I think this would have been much more competitive at under 200 bucks uh, compared to 229. Uh, speaking of which, one last thing, they did change the connector there. Uh, and so that connector in the past with the M400 was a bit of a pain point. They went through a couple iterations. Waterproofing in particular was really troublesome. Corrosion as well. They had a battery cap, they didn't have a battery cap. Um, now they've gone with what looks almost identical to a Fitbit 
uh, surge four pin connector. So this should resolve a lot of the waterproofing issues they've had in the past using the micro USB, um, which is generally the better way to go. While I know a lot of folks like to have a micro USB or some sort of USB standard connector on the watch itself, uh, from a waterproofing standpoint, historically they just suck. There's no way around it. They've sucked for years um, and plenty of companies have tried to do things with them and it still continues to suck. So this is a lot better than that. With that, we're gonna go for a run uh, and check things out. And so we're gonna go off about a 5K run. We're gonna run through it, look at some of the accuracy pieces and look at uh, basically both during the run as well as after the run, how instant pace looked and then how the GPS track looked. Okay, so here we are on the first run. Uh, I got the 430 all ready to go. It keeps on wanting to pair in my chest strap, so I'm keeping on tell it no here. Um, you can see it's got the heart rate there, uh, 106 right now. It's got my GPS signal and it's, it was pretty much really quick, ready to go. Uh, I've got a bunch of other units here to capture data. I'm looking for heart rate data and GPS accuracy data. Uh, so is the heart rate accurate? And I've got the optical heart rate, of course, on the 430. I've got the Sunto Spartan Wrist HR here as well that also has optical heart rate. I've got um, under my sh shirt right there, the uh, Skosh with the Valencell optical heart rate sensor on it. It is being captured on the Phoenix 3. And then I've got a 935 here that's capturing data from a Wahoo ticker chest strap. So therefore I've got four different uh, heart rate sources, I've got four GPS sources, and let's go see how this works. Okay folks, so here we are running along, uh, about 10 minutes into the run right now. So far so good. Heart rate is uh, matched pretty well, so this ghost has me at uh, 163, the ticker at 164, the Sunto at 166, and the pull right now at 166. Keep in mind as I'm saying this though, things do vary, so they're shifting a bit as I'm talking and all that, but so far so good. Distances also seem pretty good, pretty consistent between them, and pacing seems pretty even as well. So let's keep on going. Okay, so as a look at distance right now, all the watches are within 0 0.02 miles, uh, so less than a uh, percent and a half based on my current distance, uh, which is pretty good. You can see my instant pace right there at the top. That's a 643, 637. So it's pretty good. I'm going slightly downhill, so I'm speeding up. What I'm gonna do here in a second is actually just simply stop and see how quickly it responds. There we go. So it's pretty quick. I mean, that was right there. Five to seven seconds to stop. Keep in mind, it couldn't use my wrist for the cadence right now because I was holding the wrist up, so that's gonna impact things. But you can see it's pretty quick to respawn and going back down again, so that's good. That means that responsiveness and pace is good. I'm not seeing any oddities there in terms of like taking a long time for lag to start and stop, which is nice. And the pace smoothness while I'm running is also pretty good as well. So, We'll do is we'll hit this little section right here. And I'm gonna keep a nice smooth pace. I'll try to anyways and see how it looks. Okay, now that we're on a nice little straightaway here, you can see pretty straightforward. Some buildings off to the right there, uh, but not too bad, open to the left. We're gonna look at instant pace and basically look how stable it is. So as I run here, now keep in mind the fact that I'm holding my wrist is gonna dork with things a little bit because I actually use the accelerometer to try to even up GPS pace. So, nonetheless, here we go. 640, the top numbers at pace, minutes a mile. 643, 646. Not too bad. I mean, I'm obviously shifting a little bit because I'm trying to talk and run with the camera, and it's kind of like when someone tells you not to blink and then you blink versus if I'm just out running pace tends to stay pretty stable by itself, but overall what I'm seeing as I'm running along, not holding the camera, is that pace is pretty stable, and as you saw just then, it's also pretty stable when I'm holding it. Yep. Let me wrap up my run, we'll head back inside, and we'll dig into some of the data. So here we are inside looking at the data. Um, this is using the DCR analyzer. Uh, you can check the link in the bottom there if you want to see how I do this. Uh, basically allows me to overlay data between different units and compare them. So it's pretty cool. Um, what we got in the first few minutes here is definitely some heart rate wonkiness. And so I went ahead and I licked the chest strap that you see around the five minute marker there. I you know, did that for first whole video intro. Uh, basically, I think it dried out. So I just uh, licked it and gave it some, some stuff to make it better uh, from a connectivity standpoint. So that was fine after that point in time. Um, the skosh, I also adjusted a bit as 
as well about five or six minutes in because uh, I was seeing some weird stuff there. So anyways, once all that was done, um, around the seven minute marker, everything was fine. So if you look at the polar data in here, it's the one in the teal color. Um, it actually tracks really nicely for this entire warm-up phase, which is something that uh, can be really tricky for heart rate sensors in general for that first couple minutes. But uh, the polar did well here, uh, and as actually did the, the Sunto as well, also for that first portion. Um, it did drop right there a little bit, but I'm not sure if that was me or whatnot. It's really hard to tell in these first couple minutes because it's kind of such a mess. So if I do this instead and just focus on the rest of the run, You'll see that by and large stuff did really well. I mean, it's uh, I see a little bit up here with uh, this ghost I mentioned earlier had some oddity until I fixed it there. Uh, but other than that, everything was like really solid across all these units, um, agreeing for the most part uh, throughout this. I stopped and started a bunch from that run on purpose to try to go ahead and basically you know caused issues, and, and I didn't really see that. So you can see here when I uh, stopped and started walking. All these units tracked very, very closely through that portion where I, I decreased my heart rate. And then again, I started um, in some of these right here, I went and did some intervals where I basically, I really kicked up a notch and they all tracked uh, very, very closely uh, through that, which is good. And the same here at the very end as well. I did a, a really hard interval for about 40 seconds, just threw down. Um, and all these units tracked uh, without any issue across that uh, within a couple seconds of each other, which is what I'm looking for. So that was that was pretty good. Um, let's go down. Uh, so elevation data, the unit does not have barometrical, barometrical altimeter in it. So it's gonna be a mess, uh, as you can see there. Instead, let's look at GPS data. Uh, so I wanna dig into this. At a high level, everything looks pretty good. It's all pretty similar between these four units. Uh, keep in mind, as you saw in the video, I put the uh, Phoenix 3 and the 4935 on the spy belt that I had uh, for about three quarters of the run here. So once I got into the gardens, uh, just because I was running out of hands for things. So that will impact GPS on those units a little bit, um, that you do actually see that in the garden a little bit, at the exact point I put it on the spy belt, which is is fine. Uh, that's just something to keep in mind so you're not uh, worried about that. Um, so going and starting the run here, I'm just going along the K and I'm going to switch over to satellite mode because it's something I prefer for looking at uh, GPS track accuracy. So three of the four units track really well. Uh, the Sunto unit is off a little bit offset um, until we get into the gardens here. Once I get into the gardens, uh, they track fairly well. You can see the 935 off in the bushes. That's when I put it on my uh, waist belt there. So again, that's completely blocking the signal. That's just fine. Um, and they, they kind of go through here pretty darn similar. Uh, this churn here is actually interesting. You can see they do really well in this. All four units uh, nail this churn right there and then wrap around again. Um, all of them are, are within you know a meter or two where I was running, which is nice. And this is all tree line right here underneath uh, some pretty big trees uh, and no problems through there. Um, again, cutting out the gate here, they all get right into the gate. Um, so if you look here, just really zoom in there, uh, you can see they like all within a, a meter or two of where I ran, which is great. Um, across the traffic circle, across the bridge, uh, no issues there. The, the turn there, no problems. They do differ a little bit right here on where they think that track is exactly within what looks like about th three meter range or so. Um, I'm not really sure what to think exactly, but uh, they're all pretty darn close. They do separate those. We go down this section here. Um, so the 935 is, is technically the most correct of these units. Um, they're all kind of like separated by a few meters each, but then over the course of what is probably a 20 meter spread. Um, this is all against these big buildings that you see here. But the Polar uh, M430 and the 935 certainly are the closest once we get into this. Uh, they're very much you know, right next to each other here. Uh, again, uh, as we go around this corner here, uh, the Polar does really well. Uh, and I would say that's you know between the Polar 935 and the Phoenix 3, they're all very, very close. Um, I'd even maybe give the Polar a slight edge actually, uh, because I did hit this very tip under this tree here and that it did correctly nail that. So uh, that's good. Um, go back down the the canal there. They're all kind of similar, a bit weaving. Again, these are next to big buildings here. Um, and again, keep in mind the Phoenix 3 and 935 are on my waist, so they're being blocked. Uh, so through here, uh, no issues there. And then as we hit the bridge here, uh, the Polar actually did this right. So I purposefully ran across the street here first and then turn left, and that's the only watch that actually hit that spot on. Um, so good stuff there. The rest of the run, uh, pretty straightforward, and then down to the finish there, no problems at all. Um, so there you go, just a look at the data inside. Uh, overall, pretty good there from a GPS standpoint with the Polar, I'm actually pretty happy with that. Um, I would say that was definitely one of the best units that I saw on this particular run. Do keep in mind though, this is just one run for both heart rate as well as GPS accuracy. Um, typically for reviews, I like to have a dozen or two dozen runs. Um, or you know workouts of some sort uh, to be able to look at both GPS as well as heart rate accuracy. 
Okay, folks, thanks for watching. Go and whack that like button down the bottom as well as the subscribe button. That way you're stay tuned for all the latest sports technology goodness. As we go into April here, this is really like the time of year uh, for doing lots of new products. We've got the Boston Marathon coming up, so that's a common place to launch new running products. We've got Sea Otter coming up in two weeks, another common place this time to launch cycling products. Uh, plus, we tend to see some action cameras and power meters this time of year. So lots of good stuff. Definitely stay tuned there. Have a good one.